Florencia Pita is the principal of FP Mod and co-founder of her parallel office, Pita and Plume. Florencia has been a recipient of two Graham Foundation grant awards, and her work has been widely published in publications such as Log, Architecture Record, A Plus U, and Surface Magazine. She is also the editor of Cyrex on Ramp. Florencia is a part of the permanent collection at the Mac Museum in Vienna, the Art Institute of Chicago, and other private collections. Pita is part of the design faculty at SciArc and the newly appointed graduate thesis coordinator. She has been a visiting professor at Pratt Institute in New York and Lund University in Sweden. Here, form isn't a shape. A shape is not a figure. A figure does not comply with its material. The material is not a result of a technique. The technique is not a method, but a thought. The thought might show up as a color, and color is definitely not an applique. Challenging these statements and juggling them into a project is a skill that uniquely belongs to Florencia. Today, we put these conventions to rest. Florencia, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, what do you consider the installation pulse at SciArc, your first architectural project? <laughs> well, I think that what it was interesting is that it's the first project that I did oh, with my office, and it was, the, let's say, the first independent project. Um, and it was not only a proposal, but it was something that got built, and it was, it had uh, under a budget, and, you know. Um, so, so it was a very interesting point of departure. Um, and so what you'll see is that uh, this, is, this project is, maybe you remind me, from uh, 2006. Yeah, so it's a project from 2006. I, I think it's a very interesting moment in architecture because it was a moment um, where it, it was very transformative for the discipline. You know, new things were happening. It was a more stable moment for the relationship to technology. Um, it was a kind of moment of kind of advancing the issue of um, you know new forms of design, new forms of practice, and new materialities. So the, 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 the project started by kind of interrogating all of those things. You know? So we have new materials, we have uh, new systems of representation, um, and then we have new type of environments. And so the installation looked at the space as if it was a fully immersive environment, uh, almost as if you enter an image, you know, like you enter a render. Um, that would be more clear I move on, but at the beginning it was like um, it was trying to really conceive the space as fully immersive. And so the one thing, other than the materials and the forms, the one thing that for me allowed for that was color. You know, like if you codify different parts with a single color, you create a, a system as a whole. Um, so if you codify, you created a, a space in which all of the parts had the connection of coloration, then you, you by default, created kind of an immersive environment. Um, and I saw that, it's, a, it's funny because as a project when I was in Columbia, uh, Evan Douglas was the, the gallery coordinator and he did a show for uh, uh, Michael Speaks um, on the Dutch architects. And it was very simple and the space is right when you get out of the elevator. And the single things he did is like he painted the wall and the floor in orange. The full, so you enter through just paint and it was fantastic. It was like a full immersive experience and I always told Evan that I was shocked by like just what paint can do. Uh, he found the right orange also, which is not a minor thing. Uh, and then, you know, so you kind of enter in the, in the exhibit through color. Uh, even though color was not the driver of the show, or the, but it's, uh, for me, it was a, a simple, very interesting technique. So the pulp exhibition, uh, the SciArc was a test on that, and then the new system, you know, how you work on a budget, so we literally use a single material, which is this uh, PETG, uh, very flimsy, and at that point, it, you know, like always, it was much easier if we just treated the PTC in clear, but the emphasis on really working out color made that, that we had to um, cover in vinyl 200 
four by eights by hand. Uh, so, so I was like, color has an added labor. <laughs> you know, you either have to paint something, or in this case, you have to laminate plastic. So it had to be plastic. There's no way. And vinyl is also plastic, so it's not paint. It's like actually vinyl. Uh, and then we used, so we had this corrugation system that came from ideas of Versailles and the highly artificial nature of landscaping. This is so artificial that it becomes plastic. And then the floor is the same plastic, and then the walls were painted. So you get the same, this idea of the immersive through material and color, you know, both together. Cool. Your work is plan driven, but never flat. You always maintain a three-dimensional st status. Even when you're slicing figurative volumes, you quickly slot the slices back together. So there is a constant oscillation in dimensionality. Could you elaborate on the skeletal versus the form and the 2D versus the 3D in your work? <clears throat> so, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, for many years I started working my own practice with FP mode, and then in the last four years, we. Uh, we, I started working with my partner, who's Shaki Bloom. And, and since we started to collaborate, I think you'll see that there's there, many of the issues that I was working on my own continued, and, uh, and many new things came to the front, which is a little bit of an emphasis on describing more clearly uh, the role of the line within um, three-dimensional form. So, in most of the projects that we work on, you see there's an emphasis on a delineation of, of profiles. And so the delineation from, from, from profiles either comes from creating a profile and then work its way towards volume, or creating a volume and extracting a profile. So it's always a work that belongs to three-dimensional form, but it, it can either work you know, one way or the other one. So we um, make a lot of emphasis on our interest on the 2.5D. And the 2.5D that we have trying to develop, and then we try that at every project, we test that out, is that it has this quality of massing, uh, and, it, and somehow it brings back architectural features to the front. You know, so now that the kind of the, the complexities of a three-dimensional form somehow get um, outlined with, with this. So it is, if when I started working with the computer, I always tell my student that I was, when I was a graduate student, I was Maya one. So just count my years since then through how many, what's Maya today? I mean, do Maya 15. So, so we had rules. They were a lot more strict. So Maya 1 had very specific rules for how you can work on. So we had you know, the splines, you can, so loft, you know, so surface to lines relationships were clear, more clear. I think now that you work with meshes or you, you know, so, or you work with found volumes. So it was the line was highly emphasized, but then you have one way in which you can make mass, which is lofting. And that created a whole generation of lofted projects. We still don't, we don't see them anymore, now we see them built. You know, like they've reached that, you know, level of maturity, I think. Um, so now you have more freedom, you can actually do anything, you know. So then you have the freedom to have what I, I call sometimes the kind of um, multiple ontologies of form, you know. So you don't have um, a linear system, like the linear system of the lofting, you know, you have you, you can really work in multiple directions within the mass. It's interesting that you talk about strictness because the next question I was going to ask you was about extrusion. Extrusion is something that keeps appearing and disappearing in your work. What effect does it have that keeps attracting you to explore it further? And can extrusions be too simple? Well, I think that's why they appear and they disappear because sometimes they can be too simple. But I think, and, and this is again some of the things that we do with Shaki, is that the, the power of the contour is at, at its highest with extrusion. Like once you have a profile, a very elaborate profile, um, and you extrude that profile, this is how, when it has the most power. 
Um, but what happens because it's like augmented through its volume, you know, through its volume. But what happens with extrusion then is like it's somehow one directional. So it, it brings us back a little bit to lofting. It's, it's very similar to lofting. Um, so extrusion, we end up going back always to extrusion because we want to maintain the power of the contour or the profile of the figure, you know, like the power of the figure stays there, but then we'll find other ways in we can we can diverge from extrusion. And that's why in some projects it's like it starts with extrusion and it starts to move away as if you can have you know multiple type of surfaces, not necessarily the ones that follow up that contour or the profile or as I said before, that it comes out of a mass and then it goes back to being extruded. So so it's true, we go in and out of extrusion not to assume its um, radical <laughs> simplicity, I would say, but how to re-imagine its, its, its power, let's say. Whether you're working on a ring, a pavilion, or a building, there's a sense of scalelessness to your projects. It seems that this is achieved by erasing the scenes and erasing the fabrication process. How important is scale to your projects? And to what extent do you allow the technique of fabrication to show in the work? <clears throat> well, I always thought that, ex that scale was something that, that we own as a discipline. You know? So, you know, other disciplines don't have much choice, you know, like I think it's, it's like a, a film director has different film types, you know, like of course he works in like, he can work in scale in terms of what he's looking at. I mean, he definitely can work. Uh, but we have, we can really transfer information from one scale to the other one. Um, and I was raised to think that scale was one. Like, you know, I mean, as an undergrad uh, student, you, I was taught in a very a more traditional modernist uh, manner that scale belonged to certain objects. You couldn't shift, you couldn't put the scale, that was kind of wrong. Same sense as style, color, all those things were wrong. Um, but I think that in a way, I mean, uh, postmodernism broke that rule. Uh, they literally took the scale of a cheap and dull furniture could become a building, you know, crone. Uh, crone. Um, so, so of course, postmodernism has the bad things, but some of the good things that it has is that it kind of, it broke with a tradition uh, that belonged to the kind of new scale of modernism. Uh, and then they started to look at things of culture uh, as kind of references, and then have non, they're non-scalar, non-scalar. Uh, you look at the work of Venturi and Scott Brown, for example, I mean, they're great examples where scale is not relevant. You know, they play with scale. They can take an ornament uh, from a, a Vitruvian, uh, you know, drawing and then blow it up to a facade. Uh, they can take the scale of a letter and then blow it up to a full, you know, elevation. And, and you know, they saw that in Vegas happening, you know, like you could, you work at the scale of the sign, you work at the scale of the building. So those, I think, that those broke the tradition of the kind of uh, strong, uh, attachment that you had to the, the, the scale of things, you know, like the modular, um, the Da Vinci. So those things, uh, for me, I mean, I, I think they have been, they've been relevant to how you look at design, but I think the most interesting is when you can start to challenge scale, you know, like how uh, you inhabit a space that is not necessarily following any human proportions. Um, so, so, so I think that scale uh, it has uh, multiple possibilities. And in this case, you see that sometimes it's, it's a small installation that gets blown up at the scale of a building. I think in the case of our practice, it has to do also with the chances of the type of projects that you can engage. Like we have a lot of gallery spaces or installation or small prototypes. And it's a chance of those those uh, realms, let's say, of the areas of expertise that allow you to then go to the bigger scale. Like maybe if I had only buildings, only clients that give me museums and tower, 
I would say I would be, you know, focusing on or hoping to get a small scale object. Um, but I think that that and, and it's interesting because it's a, such a reduction of information that you have with a single object that it's it's interesting to see how you can work on ideas and not with you know the kind of the actual object you know like there's no most of the objects also we do have no functionality so it's not going from a sofa to a but actually they have some level of abstraction that allows them to kind of shift scale. And what about the the process, the technique, in a lot of the installations when we look at the work, the technique is in a way erased. We see a final product, we don't see how it's put together, and in a way, unless you're an expert at what you do, you don't really know how it was made. <coughs> I think, I, I think, I always have this conversation with Greg Lynn, um, and, uh, and, uh, and I always tell him that, for me, he's an inventor. Um, anything that Greg does, so I was kind of educated with him, you know, being five years at his office. It's like it, uh, looking at things somehow, if Greg doesn't invent the material, the technique, the machine, he's not interested, you know, like he has to, he's, he's a true inventor. And so the, you know, a few things he's done through, he focuses on a high level of innovation. I, I think that in that sense, I don't think that we are inventors. I think that we work with, um, with multiple systems and multiple methods. Um, so none of them aim at novelty, uh, but they aim at reinforcing certain ideas. So we are not so interested in the process where, you know, like I think many years ago we said, well, we mill it and we vacuum farm it. I mean, we're not saying that. All those already, as I said, like Greg invented something. He's like, well, I'm going to use this particular fiberglass or this fiber wire, or if not, you know, it, uh, you know I'm not going to do it out of traditional materials. But we see the, the chances of, of working directly with like design. But the one thing that we are very interested in is in the relationship to, to color and pattern. Um, and so some of those things, you know, I think that when we get the chance maybe to build some buildings, uh, we might innovate within that realm. But I don't think you won't see we are cantilevers or you won't see strange uh, euphoric structural behaviors in none of the projects or the novelty of certain amount of scripts that are used to design. Uh, I think that we are more interested in how we can shift the conversation uh, in some, in, you know, in certain, and, and that conversation stays within the realm of architecture. So it's highly architectural, but at the same time it tries to maybe connect to art as painting and, you know, but it's, so technique is not the driver. So maybe we don't talk a lot about technique because it's not the main driver, I would say. This was a question I was gonna ask you to the end, but you went right into it, so I'm gonna push it forward. When you describe projects, you usually use works of fiction that in a way don't really relate to it. In addition, your work is heavily impacted by fine arts. So your work is architectural, but it hides its architectural influences and then pretends not to talk about architecture. Do you think that's a fair statement? And do you consider your work autonomous within the discipline? <clears throat> well, I, I think that the earlier project, mostly the installations, I found it, uh, I would say, the way, fiction was a way out of um, theorizing every element. And it was for this idea of immersion like, so if you did not have a description, you know, like how the project was made or whatever the ideas are coming from, but you like had a parallel narrative that look at the space or the thing itself, uh, it was one way in which you are even more immersed. I mean, the exhibition here, Saya was one example, a friend of mine who's a writer, uh, Bruna Mori, and she, she's a fantastic writer, so she created this um, world. Um, now that you remind me, we will use it again. <laughs> but, uh, but 
there's something, um, but you will see that even if, if fine arts, we talk a lot about art and, and the relationship between um, painting and architecture, uh, some elements of sculpture and architecture more than anything else, you know, more than other realms. Um, I think it has to do with trying to figure out, um, uh, try to figure out uh, ways through working with color. As you saw, that since 2006, every single project has been in color. At times where there were not much color around. <laughs> uh, the occlusion render had a dominance or like the kind of fake metals and so on. So color has been always present. So it, it, it has achieved more complexity up to now. Um, but the idea that when you look at painting, you look at the expertise, the high expertise of colors through how they are trained, the eyes, how they see. And I don't think everything can be transferred from art, but there are a lot of techniques that you learn from artists. Our last, the lecture that we did here, we literally look very specifically at techniques that move from paint towards print. Because it's the same problem we have, like how do you move from traditional means of using color picking to complex means of image reproduction. Maybe you have a question of that. that. So it, none of them avoid architecture uh, because you'll see that like the issue of the line, the contour, the elevation, uh, the space, the notion of proportion, those go back to architecture. But since color, I would say, is at the center of the investigation, that becomes a kind of much stronger driver. The next question probably doesn't have an exact answer, but maybe we can get as close to an answer as possible. What's your strategy in choosing color? Is it a psychological, aesthetical, ephemeral, or a contextual sensibility? <laughs> well, I, I think maybe neither of, <laughs> neither, neither of them. Um, I think color, color is related to uh, some very architectural issues, which have to do with, um, which has to do with a kind of coding onto materials. So you look at the materials, or you look at traditional materials, or even non-traditional materials, uh, they are coded with their innate uh, logic, like wood is wood, you know, there's like woodness in wood. Uh, there's uh, steelness in steel, you know, so there's essences in, in materials. And color has always been this kind of fake, you know, so color is considered a fake veneer. So because you either painted something, you know, you, um, brutalism allows us to not paint uh, concrete, which is fantastic, but it brought this truthness in the 60s, the truthness of color. And, 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 and what happens is that there's a kind of dominance of that, and it becomes a kind of coding onto buildings. So from the beginning, what I found interesting in color is that color allows you to disguise and, and allows you more levels of freedom. So things didn't have to be what the material presented, uh, but actually, they could be, and you know, and you have, um, you know, people look at uh, Egyptian uh, architecture and so on, and imagine these are stone, or you know, at most of the columns and they were painted. So there's a this kind of level of artificiality that can come from another ornament ornament onto that. So color is both is, is an ornament, uh, and it's also a disguise of materiality. And it allows you to kind of open up new territories, you know, where you are beyond, you know, I, I love like, for example, Formica, you know, this kind of fake wood, this fake marble veneers on plastic. Uh, those are fantastic, but you know, they still has a marble pattern. So you can go and, you know, you can go beyond Formica, let's say, and then, and then Formica is that, yeah, it's a, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Now. So you can edit that. But. Uh, so, so that kind of uh, level of artificiality, it's, uh, uh, it's, it was something was always fundamental for color. 
But then when you start to dwell onto color and then you start to look at color combination, color pattern, color printing, color image, it's a lot more complex. So it's not about painting one space pink like the first project, but what if you use image as a printout for a building? Um, what if you start, what if you have a facade plus an image of a facade? And so color becomes a drawing, you know, a, a way to kind of recreate um, materialities or, or, you know, materialities and new ornamentations, like, you know, the same way that uh, materials produce uh, textures and patterns. That leads me perfectly to the next question. Um, there are two scenarios that happen in your projects that I want to focus on. One is where color is autonomous but material is mixed. And the second is where color is mixed and, mate uh, and material is autonomous. Can you talk about the difference between mixing colors versus mixing material and what effect it has? <clears throat> well, I think that it's, um, in uh, some of the projects, uh, we look at like in Taichung, um, in the Taichung Museum and the Library in Taiwan. And then in that project in particular, for example, it has an exposed concrete, but it's like a, a fake concrete, and it's combined with a, like a fake pattern or texture pattern of a ceramic tile. And so in that case, it was kind of exposing certain materiality, which eventually could have been also like the formica, could have been fake, concrete images. Um, but that, 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 that brought too much of a kind of duality of like where you have the true color or, and glass, or you have the fake texture material. So th there's, no, it's, there's no autonomy of, of materials. You know? There's always this sense of collage or the interesting collage that you can go in and out of materials. So without rejecting wood, but advancing it. You know, for me, the work of Herzl on the Meron is fantastic in that, that way. Um, in the way that they challenge materials, but they maintain those materials. So they challenge glass by printing on glass. So it looks like a silk screen finish and it, it becomes translucent and so on. But it's still glass, you know, it has the color of glass and so on. Um, and they've advanced for me the discipline within the, the constraints of architecture, within the autonomy of traditional materials, you know. But the concrete, printed concrete, uh, plastic finishes, uh, very strange, you know. Uh, so they, they, they are interesting on, on that line. And I, and uh, Chef Kimnitz has this fantastic article, this, The Cunnings of Cosmetics, that opened, for me that article, I would say the final year of undergrad, opened the world to say, hey, I can do anything I want now. <laughs> I don't have to be, have the heavy weight of modernism with me, I'm free. And so it, 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 it did it, Herzog on the Metro did it in a, in a, in a, in a let's say, um, linear way, so you have the, the, the materials, the, Swiss, the materials have very strong um, history, let's say, but they, they, they challenge them all up. And so, so we take on from that point on, you know, so how you can take it to the extreme. You just take the materials out. And so they work, even for them, it's between highly influenced by Andy Warhol um, and uh, with this notion of the you know, the kind of silk screening of like images that lose their value by repetition and by texture. Um, and then they also take on uh, Venturi Scott Brown on like culture can come in, you know, you can use everyday cultures, you can use images of, or patterns from culture and put them into architecture without um, abandoning the law, the high, you know, um, field of materiality. And so this, but then in, in, if you look at Venturi Scott Brown, they really take it on in their case. The problem is that what materials, do you, what color, what texture images do you use? And they dwell on the past. But what if you dwell on the present, not, not even the future, dwell on the present. You look at new textures, new materials, new colorations, 
uh, of what you have now in the world of images that were surrounded. So, so that that is that's where we're right now at. You know, what is the role of the image in in architecture? Color forming is a shift from paint to print. You also explain that it no longer has a painterly effect, but an industrial effect instead. Why is the shift important, and how does it help the discussion of printing on material versus printing on building? <clears throat> well, I think that it's, it's something that we are, that's a question for you, it's a question for us. Um, we are looking at the ways in which you you move away from uh, what architecture traditionally has done of this veneer of paint um, and then move on to something that has to do with uh, texture. And it is, it goes, I mean, it, it, it actually works on the finish of a, of a building because the material will like work as a finish. So we're trying to find in between what is the, the material that can allow us to do an ornament of print onto a building. So you have, so we look at ceramic tiles. Ceramic tiles have a history within architecture. They work on outdoor spaces. So, um, so it's, an, it's an, a material that necessitates a print or necessitates a pattern as a finish. You know, you, I mean, you can leave it, it, it uh, terracotta color if you want to, but let's say you want something more out of that or the bathroom pile, tile pattern, but it's, it's a material that is ready for a printout. So in that case, the material becomes a good uh, hinge towards architecture. And if not really looking at material, exactly, exactly what I was telling you before, this, this Herzog and the Meron tradition of like challenging traditional materials and taking them the next step, um, that was our take on ceramics. So how you can take a very traditional, very old material and then use print as a method. Your other question about the painterly effects and the kind of techniques, um, we, and then I think you, I think I didn't answer a question that you asked earlier about like we are, uh, you know, art and architecture, you know. So it's definitely within towards architecture. The use of art is that for us, the, the art expertise on color and pattern uh, and the color palette, the selection of color, it's something that is beyond our um, design stage. Architects are much behind artists because artists also only need a canvas. <laughs> so I think their world is simplified and they have to sell it at the prices they sell them, but they have a, a focus on that. So since now there's not a lot of buildings happening that we can also have that same focus. So we take on problems, you know. So we're not the, since we're not the inventors, I also got rid of that mantra, you know, the conflict that belongs to Greg. Uh, there's no, we're not inventors, then we can really take on problems <laughs> and advance them. Um, I've never heard you talk about your work in the relation to the work of Anthony Gaudi. Is there a dialogue between his approach and yours? <clears throat> well, I think it's a kind of assumption that certain formalism is related to other formalisms. I find, I, I, I always like the work of Dali, um, but then I like other, uh, other Spanish architect from Barcelona, like Montaner, um, which is, it keeps, it's, it's maybe not, not as uh, exuberant as the work of Dali, but it's fantastic in terms of uh, textures, environments, and forms, which I would say I'm, I'm a little bit uh, closer. Um, I, I find fantastic the work of Dali, but it's, oh, uh, Dali, sorry. I found fantastic the work of Gaudí, but I find it a little bit, you know, I mean, it seems that all of this work, uh, it's, it, it, it presents the kind of isolation of the ideal designer, you know. As, so the work of Dali stands in some, some sort of isolation. 
And for me, it starts in an isolation that is more related to the way that medieval constructors work the, than the way that other architects from last century work. So his forms are fantastic, and, and you know the patterns and the ceramics. <laughs> so definitely looking at that work, but uh, their elements in Sagrada Familia are fantastic. But look, Sagrada Familia is similar to one of those medieval churches. I mean, it will take, I don't know how many, 100 years. I don't know when it was the 100 year anniversary of like, and they're still working on it. So you look at some examples from you know, the 1200th, the 12th century, uh, the 13th century, and so on. And then you, you see how he really represents that model. Um, so, and you'll find similarly, I think that Enric uh, Miralles, the, the Barcelona architect, the Spanish architect, uh, when, when asked about if he find a relationship with Gaudí, he'd say, you know, no. Uh, because I think it's similarly to that, you know, like it's, even though it's highly ingrained within architecture, it's an isolated case, you know. So it actually, he doesn't completely answer to his times. I mean, he had these fantastic structural elements and so on, but it's not, um, it's not the kind of that same sign of modernism that you'll find a kind of pre Art Nouveau. I mean, I really love Art Nouveau, but Art Nouveau, uh, it's, it's a kind of branch of architecture that was unfortunately canceled a few years later. Uh, didn't have the chance to kind of continue. And it's, it, it really was a movement that, that of discovery, of new materials, of, uh, uh, of new forms, and so on. You have a playful word palette. And in my opinion, the two most prominent words in that palette are figure and character. Can you define what figure is to you and character and the difference between a character's figure and a figure of a character? <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> so I, I, I mean, you'll see the, there's different words that in which um, figuration was a way out of abstraction in a way. Uh, so figuration, I was saying like in 2006, from the first project, and the first project that tried to move away from the field. So I think you have to always put in context where the project, the work started, and how it started to kind of move on. So in a world of fields, of points and lines of the late 20th century and early, I can't believe I'm gonna, I literally shift that from what happens in the 90s to what happened in the 2000s. A uh, world of fields and surfaces to the possibilities of figures. So this idea that the figure is something that comes uh, more imposed and delineated, it, it's a strength to the line. Uh, the line of the love was a soft line, as you remember. And so the line of the figure has more character. So figure and character come together. Because the figure, you know, the character it's a way of, uh, it's a kind of a, a, an idea of reduction of a figure. Um, so I always like to pair that to the notion, the idea of caricatures. You know, so caricatures are drawings of faces, but they're drawings of faces that augment features. So a caricature of Obama will make his bigger ears. And so a caricature of a, of a person, it's, it's a reduction of information with an augmentation of features. So if you do like a caricature of a house, what you do? So in the Maribor project, what we did is that we took the figure of the houses, the traditional house, as a, as a given figure, which is the pitch roof, um, which is kind of ubiquitous, you know, like that's the house, the first image you get from the house. We convert that into a caricature. It's a caricature of a building, and then we augmented features of that caricature. So then it goes, the figure is the standing element, and the caricature or the character allows you to maintain the character. You still see Obama in the Obama example. You still see Obama, but he's highly ridiculized, let's say. So there's an element of, of augmenting features, architectural features. So the picture becomes even more contorted. Or, uh, 
or the, the profiles become more. In BS1 cross-check, you'll see that you still see the caricature of the Pikachu in one of the, but you don't fully see. So it's a caricature of, the, of, of that character. So how you, you, use, the, you use that as a, as a formal method, as a kind of formal technique. For that, is that maybe will be one of your questions. For that, is that we always use found figures or figures you can recognize. In most of projects, either they're strong figures, which means that they're figures that are strong, they're highly delineated, but don't refer to anything that has some level of abstraction, or they're figures that refer to something like Pikachu in PS1, like a house in the Maribor project, uh, the context in, in, um, uh, in the Guggenheim Museum, like the, the skyline context, always a figure, but it's, 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 it's converted into a character or like caricature. To keep with the word play, how do you differentiate the roles of cartoons, graphics, and drawings in the way they influence school? These are three things that keep coming up, but they're sometimes they're coupled together and sometimes they're separated. Cartoon, graphics, and drawing. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let's go one by one. So cartoons, I'm not interested in cartoons as a representational device, meaning that the, the drawings might seem cartoonish, but they're architectural drawings. They're always renders mixed with drawings and so on. There's, ne there's never a narrative on the drawings, you know, there's never, it's like it's just the image. Um, graphics comes from this take on, on, on the, on the kind of texturing devices, like if we use a lot of halftone patterns, for example, the kind of conversion of an image into a texture or into a graphic. So that I that that is we're still investigating. You know how you can create a kind of graphic version of wood. For so wood would not be the veneer. You put a halftone pattern of wood, and you get this strange veneer. But it has a resemblance of wood. I mean, we had a, a project that we did with Shaki, which is called Blue Velvet. It's a small bench for an, uh, for an art gallery. And the idea is that we use blue velvet, the, the, the kind of sofa texture, uh, and then we made a graphic texture on that. So you still see blue velvet, so it seems that it's soft, but it's flat. So that idea that there's a graphic effects that can challenge things that you some that are familiar uh, into into new into new elements. Um, so that would be for graphic, and the last one, drawing. Drawing drawing is always present, you know. So this thing of the figure or the character, um, it that stays within the drawing. The thing is how you can start challenging what, 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 how is a drawing, you know, like how you work with, how, I mean, I had this discussion in thesis sometimes um, about a render is not a drawing, and a render is a drawing, you know, so, but it's a render, but it's a drawing. <laughs> I mean, it's not a photograph. So, so a drawing, so how can you make a, draw, a render into a drawing and maintaining it as a render? So you see most of the work, most of the work, it's not line drawings, but actually line drawings on render drawings and combine this kind of collage of the render image. So never abandoning the render, but always challenging the, the, the render as a kind of. And now we're working with photographs and line drawings and render. So the drawings are complex today. So I think, I mean, I see some students going back to printing in Mylar which it really drives me crazy because you, I used Mylar when I was in undergrad. Why would I want to move the, 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 the time back to go back to, you know, there's this somehow nostalgia of representation where you need certain familiarity of representation like ink on Mylar, which I did for years, many of us did for years. Um, which your generation does not need to do. 
You don't need to go back to that. But you can definitely do is that you don't assume that you are given a certain type of representation, but you challenge that. So I think it's great to challenge the render by advancing it, but not by, you know, kind of moving it backward. In the past, you labeled your work as brutalist pop. What elements from both are drawn into the way you think about your work? <clears throat> so brutalist pop, um, I always like brutalist architecture. <laughs> you know that? I mean, there's something, the, the certain rawness on brutalist architecture that has to do with how they find, found a way of like reducing certain forms to certain characters. It's like, it's like the character of, of buildings, you know, reduced. So it's like, it's raw. But the, the forms, the masses are fantastic. So we are really interesting, even though we're interested in, in two and a half D, but always in mass. It's never flattened completely and becomes a surface problem. It's always a problem of mass. But pop comes because also surface is very important. So the thing is, uh, how can you, it seems incongruent, but how you can couple mass, uh, massing forms with surface. So and without just attaching surface, but really looking, pop has to do with, um, of images, you know, the, of like bringing in the kind of textures of things that, that are in the realm from like posters to colors to materials to ads. Um, you know, so it's a little bit on the question of, of the decorated shed. But if the shed was not a shed, but a brutalist building, it would be more interesting. The problem about the shed is that it's a high simplification of massing but if massing can maintain some character, um, formal attributes like brutalist, and pop follow similar attributes to what um, um, the decorated shed presented as the novelty, like surface facade don't have to follow rules of uh, facade, you know, design, um, but you actually had new information you can add to the facade. So Pop and Brutalist Pop try to rethink that the relationship. Final question. Your lecture title, Oh So Pretty, reminded me of a joke I heard as a kid. A girl asks her boyfriend, am I pretty or ugly? The boyfriend replies, you're a little bit of both. You're pretty ugly. <laughs> pretty ugly. So the word pretty can be used as an exaggeration or suggesting an abundance of something. What do you focus on? And the work is pretty what to you? What is it an abundance of? Um, this, the, the title of uh, that title, it's related also to that, that notion of the kind of fake narrative that you have. You know? So <clears throat> that the, the work could uh, somehow stand by its own, you know, as a kind of shingle song. Um, and so, and pretty is not, it's like you said, it's not beautiful, you know? So it can have multiple sense. Um, I think it also comes from this notion or the beautiful, beauty and, and ugliness, you know, the kind of quite present within architecture of like, you know, what you strive for beauty or you, or not, or you strive for, um, so, so the, the idea of presenting it as, as also pretty, it's like it's a middle ground, with, it's neither, but it's actually very superficial uh, in the way that you can, you can treat it. So it's also, because I think that also, and, and I get this question a lot, you know, like it's everything is, very colorful and it's very feminine. And, and so to kind of avoid that question, and I'm thankful that you didn't ask that question. <laughs> um, to avoid that question, it makes it kind of girly, you know? It like puts it up front. So then you don't, you know, you just don't have to go through that. Uh, and so it is, it, it's a very beautiful word, you know? Again, my English is not my first language. And so, you know, it's a nice, English word for me, but it really sets up, it's like a jingle, 
that presents a mood, a kind of certain atmosphere, and then it also doesn't say much. I've always been excited about what you've had to say, and I thank you very much for sitting down. Thank you for your questions. <laughs>